If you had to pick the most inaccessible term in all of software engineering, Monad would be a strong contender for first place because of its spooky math background that uses terms like endofunctor and monoid. As it turns out, monads are an extremely powerful design pattern that can be used without any math knowledge. In this video, we'll cover what monads are, how they can be incredibly useful, and examine some common monads. All you need is a little software engineering knowledge. Let's go! Let's start with a few simple methods written in TypeScript. Even if you aren't familiar with TypeScript, the code should be reasonably simple, just a function that squares a number and a function that adds 1. So if we ran add 1 of square of 2, it'd give us 5. So far so good. Now, let's say that we want to add historical logging to these functions. What I mean by that is that right now we started with 2 and ended with the result 5, but I want to see the process of how it got from 2 to 5. The result might look something like this. You can see that alongside the result, there's a logs array, and each operation along the way has added an element to it to show us how the item got there. In real life, this might be useful for an audit trail to show the operations that were carried out in code, but for this toy example, we're just manipulating numbers. How should we code this new feature? Well, first, we want to define a struct to capture the return type, which we'll call number with logs. It has the result and the logs array. Second, we'll make the square function return a number with logs and return the expected shape. Third, we'll change add1 to take a number with logs and perform the expected operation. Since it's taking a number with logs as the argument, we need to combine whatever logs came in with the new logs by appending the new entry at the end. Looking good! Although this works, there are some issues with how this is written. First, what if I want to do square of square of 2? It doesn't work because the first square returns a number with logs, but the second square expects a number. Also, what if I want to do add 1 of 5? It doesn't work because add1 expects a number with logs, not a normal number. We can fix this with a new function called wrap with logs, which takes a number and returns a number with logs, like a constructor of sorts. It helps numbers enter the number with logs ecosystem, so to speak, so that one can call functions that expect number with logs. We'll set the logs to an empty in array since nothing has been done yet. Now, we can solve both problems that we talked about. First, we can change square to take a number with logs. That way, we can execute square of square of 2 by doing square of square of wrap with logs of 2. And to do add 1 of 5, we just need to do add 1 of wrap with logs of 5. On to our next issue. There seems to be some duplicated logic between square and add 1. Specifically, both of them are doing log concatenation. Is there a way to factor this out? Yes, with a little ingenuity. First, we're going to move some stuff around to make square easier to read. It's the same logic, just separated a little bit better. This will help us see how our new function that we'll write in just a few seconds called run with logs will help by handling the log concatenation for us. Instead of the old style, which looks like this, we'll use the new function like this. While this seems like more code than just add one of rapid logs of five, bear with me and we'll see how this takes some load off of add one and square. From the use case and signature, you can see that run with logs takes two arguments. The first is a number with logs, and the second is a function to apply to a number that returns a new number with logs. And the overall function returns a number with logs. Now, here's the body. Let's walk through this carefully. First, we run the transformation function, like add1, on the number passed in to get a new number with logs. Then, we take the number from it and use that as the result and take the logs from the input we passed in and append any logs generated. If you squint, you can see how the latter part of the function is identical to the rewritten square on the left. All that's different is that we've taken the square e part and moved it to the transform argument so it becomes more flexible. The net result of this is that add1 and square do not need to do log concatenation anymore and become simpler. They also don't need to take a number with logs as their argument anymore and can take a simple number. Nice, we've come a long way. Let's admire our handiwork. With this setup, we can combine arbitrary transformations in any order you like, which we couldn't do earlier. And we can add new transformation functions, like add2 or multiply by 3, by just writing another function, and it works with our run with logs without any additional effort. And on top of that, with their handy run with logs function, log concatenation is completely hidden away. The transformation functions like add1 and square don't have to worry about log concatenation because it happens in one place run with logs. You might be asking, okay Alex, this seems useful, but where are the monads? Well, we just wrote a monad. You're looking at one. Surprise! Monads, at their core, are a helpful design pattern, and we just built one from scratch. 
Hopefully that wasn't as bad as you expected, and you got to see why monads are really valuable. They allow you to chain operations, like add one and square, while secretly managing busy work or other complex things behind the scenes, like combining log entries, in this case. All monads have three components. First, a wrapper of some sort that marks the type of the monad. In our example, it was number with logs. Second, they have a function that takes normal values and wraps it up in the monad, like a constructor of sorts. In broader parlance, it's called return, pure, or unit. Those aren't great names in my opinion, which is why I think of it as wrap. For our example, wrap with logs played the role of the wrapping function. Finally, monads have a function that takes the wrapper type and a transform function that accepts the unwrapped type and returns the wrapper type. In broader parlance, this is called bind, flat map, or the symbol. I like to think of it as running because it runs the transformation function on the argument passed in, doing monad-y stuff behind the scenes like concatenating logs. In our example, that was run with logs. To make this more concrete, let's look at another useful monad called option, also known as maybe. It represents the possible non-existence of a value. A number has to be a number, but an option of a number is a thing that might have a number in it or nothing at all. Similarly, an option of a user has either a user in it or nothing. It's like the fact that things can be null or undefined, but using an explicit type, which makes it safer and easier to check at compile time. Let's go over the three components. First, the type, which is option. In this case, it's actually generic, which means that it can wrap any type. For example, it can wrap a number and get an option of a number, a string and get an option of a string, etc. We use the caret t caret to indicate that it's generic. In fact, most monads are generic in this sense. Our number with logs example could be improved to become generic as well, since you can add logs to anything, not just numbers, but I wanted to keep things simple. Second, it has the wrap function, which takes a thing of type t and wraps it in an option, giving an option of the t. In options case, it's called sum, because it marks the thing as being something, rather than nothing, which is the value none. Finally, it has the run function, which accepts an option and a transformation function to run, just like what we said monads have. The only difference here is that the function is generic, which means that it can work on options of numbers, options of strings, etc. You can read t as the raw type, and option t as the wrapped type. Just like the transform functions before, like square, took a number, which is the raw type, and returned a number of logs, which is the wrapped type, the transform function here takes a t, the raw type, and returns an option of t, the wrapped type. Here's what the body looks like. If you pass an empty option, meaning it's none, it returns none. If you pass in something with a value in it, it runs transform on that value. This lets you chain operations without worrying about none values. To see how this might be useful, let's look at a use case where we want to fetch the current user, get the user's pet, and then the pet's nickname, where all of those things could be missing. Here's what it might look like without the monadic option. Every time you run an operation, we need to check to see if the result is undefined and short circuit to avoid continuing. The syntax user pipe undefined means that the user variable is either a user or is undefined, which is often how missing values are represented in JavaScript without using option. This code might ring a bell, given how often engineers need to handle missingness in real code. But it looks so much nicer with monads, assuming those get functions now return options. In this code, the true value of option becomes clear. Not once in this code is undefined or things being missing checked manually. It all happens in run. If user is nothing, for example, user pet and user pet nickname will also be nothing, and get pet and get nickname will not be run. It's so convenient to be able to manage the lack of a value without constantly having to perform checks all over the place. In some languages, you can call run as a method on the option directly, so the code becomes even cleaner and more chainable. As I mentioned before, monads are an amazing design pattern that allow you to chain operations like get pet, get nickname, add one, or square, while secretly managing busy work or other complex things behind the scenes. In the number with logs case, it was combining logs behind the scenes. In the option case, it was handling missing values. There are many more that we'll touch on later in this video, but first I want to dive into this managing things behind the scenes concept a little more, now that we've seen two monads. When using monads, the general flow of data looks like this. You start with an unwrapped value, which you can wrap to enter monad land. After that, the run function unwraps the monad for you so that it can do its secret work. 
and then invokes the transformation function on the unwrapped value. For example, the option monad handles missing values in this step. The unwrapping part is the part of the monad usage that is quote unquote behind the scenes, while the transformation functions are the part that you, as the monad user, get to pick. This alternating flow of control is what makes monads so useful. They alternate behind the scenes work, indicated in purple, with user supplied transformations, indicated in blue, so that users can write code that effectively pretends that behind the scenes work doesn't exist. This alternating pattern happens with every additional transformation, alternating back and forth between you and the monad, between unwrapped normal land and wrapped monad land. Monads are sometimes likened to programmable statements for this reason, because they allow you to write seemingly normal statements in code while having extra logic embedded in every step. For example, look at this monad-y code and imagine if we changed all the options to normal values, assuming that we don't need to handle missing values anymore. What would the code look like? It looks fairly similar to the monad code, which is amazing. It's a marvel that it's possible to write code that is only a little more complicated and yet is able to abstract away the whole concept of missing values. Remember the non-monad version of this code that handles missing values, which had a ton of if statements and looked very different. What other monads are there and what do they provide? We cover two already. First, the number of logs monad, which is known more generally as the writer monad and which abstracts away accumulation of log data during computation, and the option monad, which abstracts away the possibility of missing data during computation. Another useful one is future, also known as promise depending on the programming language. This one abstracts away the idea that a value might not yet be ready at that precise moment, in other words, that things can be asynchronous and only be available later. The monad internals of future take care of all the callback slash async slash scheduling stuff for you, and you don't need to deal with it at all. There are many other well-known monads out there, but option, feature, and the last monad we'll discuss today are the ones you're most likely to encounter. The final monad we'll cover before wrapping up is the humble array or list. You might be thinking, wait, lists are monads? What do they abstract? Viewed from a monadic perspective, lists abstract the idea of branching computation or parallel universes. Let's say Doctor Strange, the time-traveling wizard who can see all future possibilities, has to pick from three doors labeled red, green, and blue. And after walking through a door, he flips a coin, getting heads or tails. Let's say he uses his powers to figure out how many possibilities there are and what they look like. He would arrive at six possibilities, which is three times two. We can capture the possibilities with this code. We start with the three doors and run a monadic list transform on it. The transform function is run once per door, and returns another list with heads and tails appended. After running this code, the door and coin possibilities array contains this. Red heads, red tails, green heads, green tails, blue heads, blue tails. These represent the two instances of branching, first by the door choice and second by the coin result. If Doctor Strange then decides to eat an apple, banana, or orange, the possibilities could be captured with yet another call to run, and then would have an array with 6 times 3 equals 18 entries. If you're feeling skeptical about this way of thinking about lists, that's okay. It's only a perspective to view the list monad, but you can happily use the run function, which for lists is called flatmap, without having to think about it that way. In fact, it's all in the name. Flatmap is mapping, followed by flattening the resulting list. So the code we just saw is the same as mapping, which generates this intermediate value, followed by flattening, which removes those extra internal arrays. This is a useful function by itself, and you don't need to think about lists as monads in order to use it. Let's recap everything we've covered so far. Monads are an amazing design pattern because they allow you to chain operations while secretly managing busy work or other complex things behind the scenes. When using monads, the general flow of data looks like this. You start with an unwrapped thing, which you wrap to enter monad land. After that, you supply transformation functions to run on an unwrapped object which turns it back into a wrapped object and returns to monad land. What happens in between is that the monad implementation takes care of unwrapping it for you so it can do some work behind the scenes. Some popular examples include the option monad, which hides away missing values, and the future monad, which hides away the idea that values might not yet be available. Finally, all monads have three components. First, a type wrapper, like option. Second, a function that takes normal values and wraps it up in the monad, called return, peer, or unit. And finally, the flat map bind or caret caret equals function, which applies transformations to monads. 
I hope this was helpful to you and that monads now feel a little bit more approachable. If you enjoyed this video, please consider sharing it with someone else who might enjoy it too. Thanks for watching.